Sustainability Fisheries Partnership, SFP, plays a really key role for ASTA because you know, we're not fisheries biologists. Um, we've got, whilst we've got a fairly important range of fisheries products, it's quite difficult to make sure that we've got up-to-date expertise and guidance, people that are involved with the science day-to-day. So we needed to find someone that could provide that. What SFP do for us is they act as a critical friend. So it's important to have the, someone sort of pointing out the issues which are developing as knowledge improves, as fisheries change, management changes, to, to be able to, someone who can reflect and then give us some opinions. At the end of the day, these are our decisions. But to have someone out there that's an honest broker that can help us assess the situation and assist us in coming to our, our decisions. And it's very difficult to do that. It's not an easy role to play. And they're quite skilled and you know, they've got the right balance of commercial understanding. Um, so there's not a, uh, they're not coming at it as a single issue. And these things are very rarely single issue. There's always some complexity and you need to be able to understand the context before you start to make some decisions. Because it would be, you know, and I think history has shown this, where people have made quick reactive decisions and unfortunately, they've not been the right ones. So where do we start from? We started from looking at the fisheries that we were sourcing from. So which ones should we have concerns over? Which ones could we use our commercial influence to improve? Um, and starting not only just using, because they've got a ranking system around fish source, which gives you guidance about what, uh, what their assessment of those fisheries stocks are. Um, but also, you know, at, at the time, um, you know, I think uh, SFP are in the same place that we are, that we would prefer that people had achieved Marine Stewardship Council certification, MSC certification, is the gold standard. But they reflect that there are some species that aren't there, and there are some areas, especially around uh, increasingly aquaculture, where we've got to find other solutions because MSE is directed towards caught fisheries. So we couldn't, we, we had to find some way of being able to understand what our role should be with other fish and other aquaculture species. So that's then developed from the point where we've now uh, used their metric system and our suppliers provide not only the fish that they're sourcing, but also the volumes. So we can understand entirely across our portfolio of, of fish sales and the, the lines that we stock, what, um, I suppose what commercial importance it is and also what the uh, status of the sustainability of those fisheries are. I, I think consumer understanding of some of the issues is pretty, is, is, it's tricky. I think consumers use large organisations, large retailers, large fish brands um, uh, to, uh, as assurance that they expect us to have done the right things for them. And that's not an unreasonable thing to do. You know, we're big organisations, they spend a lot of money with us, they would expect us to be doing the right thing. They don't expect to go in and make assessments about whether or not this is more sustainable than that. Not unreasonably, they come into the store expecting everything sustainable. So we've got to meet that aspiration. And, and the way that we need to do that is by working, and it can't just be one large organisation. You know, even one large retailer is large in a British context, but against a global seafood industry, you know, we've got to find people to link in with and partner and are able to build some real influence. But I, I think there's a real difference in, in changing attitudes. So if you talked to me a decade ago and came and said, look, this fish you've got here is unsustainable, the response will be, okay, I'll delist it. I won't sell it anymore. And I think one of the things that we've learned is, whilst that might have worked as an instance, will it stop the fishers catching that species? No. And the reality is because, you know, if people like retailers aren't buying it, the value is going to go down. The fishers are more likely to catch more of it to maintain their incomes. So we've actually created a, a negative feedback loop. What the response to do is to say, okay, there are issues here with that fishery, let's work with them to resolve them and therefore help to sustain that fishery and that community that relies upon it. I think that's the right approach rather than just delisting and casting these people adrift, using our commercial leverage for advantage. But I think you've just got to reflect on the changing society. You know, the number of people with smartphones, the number of people who are engaged with the digital revolution, a huge access to information, and incredibly quickly too. So um, you know, the idea that I could take a month and respond to a customer query, 
and write them a letter. Well, no, people send in an email and expect a pretty sharp response. And I think that places a challenge in fisheries and food sourcing in general, that we're going to ha we are going to meet an expectation from a customer to provide more information when they want it. And I think you know, this is going to open us up to being increasingly transparent. I don't think there's any um, resistance to that. It's just a matter of finding the right mechanisms to do it so that people, you know, I don't think that we can put this onto a, a, a label, but if someone's interested enough to want to investigate about where a product has come from, any of the attributes associated with it, and obviously when fish that's talking about sustainability, Sustainability, and it might also be what the social dimension to the fishery is, we can put that freely available so that people can look at it and assist them to make more informed purchasing decisions. I think there's a reassurance about that and I also think that there's a, um, a, 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 an opportunity for us to engage with consumers on this. Consumers that want to be, you know, a lot of it will just take, okay, you're doing the right thing on my behalf, but there'll be people that want to take it to another level and we have to be able to provide that information. The ch challenge that, that aquaculture has got is that it's a rapidly expanding area. You know, the, there is huge opportunity and it's expanding in areas, uh, or in, mainly in developing countries. And so the level of, of regulation and understanding is quite, quite a difficult uh, area for them to comprehend. Uh, you know, and we've obviously recognised, we know the problems, because we've had the recent example of of Chile where things haven't been managed correctly and the consequences of it. So I think there's a huge um, uh, there's a huge role in improving aquaculture standards, improving things like biosecurity and obviously sort of things like where you know, where's the feeds come from to go into those systems. But I don't think we can hold back the fact that aquaculture is going to grow. It's going to be the provider of protein for a lot, it already is, but it's going to be increasingly the provider of, uh, of protein to, to the globe. And we need to work out how do we make sure that our role in selling it as retailers is, um, is providing the right type of conditions, the right type of approaches, such that that industry is able to develop in a sustainable manner?